Falcha August Law Ela Hunna Neve Colum Killa. The Falcha Roy Gulair Hagan Lert Special to Shaw Kun Kamora a Yen of Evra Neve Colum Killa. Dinner the Fathroon Neheran. Welcome and happy feast day of Saint Colum Killa. You're all very welcome to this special lecture to commemorate and celebrate the 15th centenary of the birth of Saint Colum Killa, one of the patron saints of Ireland. My name is Alexander O'Hara, and I'm the organizer of this series of lectures hosted by the Loyola Institute in partnership with our colleagues in Trinity College Library and the Trinity Long Room Hub. The aim of this series is to combine scholarship and engagement from the fields of theology and medieval history in presenting Colum Killa in context. This evening's lecture will last about 40 minutes and there will be time for discussion and Q&A afterwards. Saint Columba of Iona or Colum Killa in Irish is a historical and religious figure who has left a lasting legacy in the cultural memory and devotional practices of the peoples of Ireland and Scotland. The great book of Colum Killa or the Book of Kells produced around the second centenary of the saint's death is one of Ireland's greatest treasures housed in Trinity College, Dublin. Today, the church celebrates the feast day of the death of Colum Killa on the 9th of June, 597 in Iona, the island monastic community in the Scottish Hebrides he founded in 563. The feast day of the saint is a central element in any cult. But how does the cycle of community commemoration contribute to the reputation for holiness and form a basis for the growth of the hagiographical dossier in calendar martyrology and the sacred biography of the saint. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Thomas O'Loughlin, who will just deliver this evening's lecture. Thomas O'Loughlin is Professor Emeritus of Historical Theology at the University of Nottingham and a corresponding member of the Royal Irish Academy. He has published extensively on the theology of the early medieval period and on the works of insular writers in particular. Among other works, he is the author of Celtic Theology, Humanity, World and God in Early Irish Writings, Adivnon and the Holy Places, The Perceptions of an Insular Monk on the Location of the Biblical Drama, and Gildas and the Scriptures, observing the world through a biblical, biblical lens. He is a series editor of Studia Traditionis Theologiae, Explorations in Early and Medieval Theology, and of the new series, Braypol's Library of Christian Sources, Patristic and Medieval Texts with English Translation, both published by Braypol's. Professor Lachlan, you're very welcome. We're just going to switch switch over to uh, to Tom at, at the moment. So, okay. over to you, Tom. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Alex, for that wonderful introduction. And it's just simply wonderful uh, to be asked to give this opening lecture on this wonderful feast day. And while we may think that Zoom is the medium of the minute and the medium brought into existence by COVID, by the end of this lecture, I hope you will see that it may fulfill one of the dreams of people like Gregory the Great, uh, Columba of Iona and his biographer Adivnon of providing that wonderful mystery called visio in distance, being able to see in the distance. 
I've given my lecture tonight a, a phrase that comes from the Martyrology of Angus. The Martyrology of Angus is singular in two ways, in that number one, it's a vernacular martyrology produced by Angus the Kuldi, probably uh, in the Monastery of Tala, probably in the last years of the eighth century. And not only is it in the vernacular, but it is in verse form. So it was a performative martyrology. This is not for reading in the refectory or reading in the liturgy. This is a celebratory uh, martyrology that was to be learnt of by heart or sung. And for today, he mentions several other saints, but then he concludes the little quatrain with Cullum Killa Kindlock. Cullum Columba, the illustrious one, picking up in that one word in Irish, a, a concept that had been central to Western hagiography for 400 years by the time he wrote, and in turn picking up a, an idea that those who had taught many were shining like the stars in heaven and so were illustrious, that's found in the book of Daniel and which is picked up in the now let us praise illustrious men who are famous in their, in their times in the book of Sirach. So in that one word, we get a very interesting vision of how someone in say around 800, viewed 250 years before their time and the island of Iona and how they in turn saw what was happening in Iona in the sixth century as fitting into a pattern that could be traced back to Jerem's De Viris Illustribus and indeed all the way back to the prophets of the Old Testament. Alex of course pointed out that this is the 1500th anniversary of the birth of Columba. The interesting thing is of, that, of course, the birthday, the Dies Natalis, that most interests his medieval readers is this day, the day of his death. And in the remainder of this lecture, I want to just focus on the significance of the day of the death, how they would have imagined they were celebrating the day of the day, the day of his death. And then, since it's very easy to give a generic lecture on anything in the early Middle Ages, and you talk about how those strange medieval people viewed the world, I would I want to try and briefly read our only textual evidence for this day, which is book three, chapter 23 of Adolfnon's Vita Columbae, and then conclude the lecture by looking at why is that such a significant document, just that chapter in itself within the context of European history. So what do we know with certainty about Columba and indeed any medieval saint? Well, the most certain thing we know is that we have a name and a date and a description in a calendar. Now, visitors to Iona today they see Relic Orn and the restored Benedictine buildings and they just pass by this as somewhere interesting but to us a graveyard is something on the very edge of existence. But look at Clan McNoise. Clan McNoise also set on the edge of water is effectively set in, a, in the middle of a cemetery. There is a Irish tourist board, Board Falsha picture of Glendalough, 
the idyll of the Celtic monastery. When you get up close to it, you see in reality a cemetery. And there is the cemetery on Iona again, and we're looking over the sound to Mull, and the building in the middle distance is, is, is the St. Columba Hotel, which it, it's, it's, it's not a Hilton. Think about the word cemetery, cemeterium. It's, it's just a Latinization on to um, as the Hebrewenses would say, of cemeterion, the place of sleeping. And it captures a whole range of images that would have been automatic to the mind of someone like Columba or his biographer Adivnon. The idea of death as falling asleep. What Western Christians would refer to as the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Eastern Christians would refer to as the Chimesis, the falling asleep. And it's still echoed in the prayer that is still found on tombstones. May that person or may they requiescant in pace. May they, O oh Lord, have rest in peace. Now we tend to think of that primarily in terms of a prayer for their eternal salvation or in some parts of Western Christianity for their delivery from purgatory. But when that phrase was came into use, the notion is far more realistic. It's may the people who are actually sleeping in this cemetery, may they have a restful sleep as they await whatever is going to befall them at the final trumpet, the second coming, however the end is seen. And so, it's against that notion that not only the great saints, but they, all of the saints that are in connection with a, with a monastery are resting and waiting there that we have to understand the fact of the celebration that we have today the fact of calendars and also the fact that there is such an attempt to describe in detail the last hours and the death and burial of Columba. Now, before I go any further, someone is going to say, oh, Lachlan is claiming that Columba is buried in Relic Oran. Well, he's not. He's just using that because it is the main burial ground of Iona and has been since the Middle Ages as a visual cue. There is disagreement among scholars as to where on the island of Iona he was buried. He was probably buried slightly to the north of the present buildings and almost certainly to the north of Relic Oran. Where, was there another burial site in the early Middle Ages? Probably not. The site of Relic Oran is probably the place that people who wanted to be buried on Iona from the very start of the monastery were buried in. But I want you to view Relic Oran not as the exact place where Columba was buried, but rather as a key to asking the more important question, why were burials at monasteries so favored? Why did kings want to be buried at monasteries? Why did ordinary people want to be buried at monasteries? 
I'd like to suggest to you that the, the, the cemetery is primarily viewed as a waiting room. Secondly, insofar as it has stones, it's a gallery of all the illustrious people that are associated. It's a little bit like uh, universities today, putting on their prospectuses, a list of their eminent graduates. The number of saints that one could claim was in one's cemetery was a marker not only of the holiness of the, the monastery as a community, but the monastery as a transhistorical entity. This is a place of saints. And it means many other things. Now, Alex mentioned the idea of a dossier of the saint. The dossier is a phrase that was put to, first used by the Bollandis in the late 19th century because they knew there were some saints that there was a vast amount known about. There were other saints that all they had was a name. So a dossier is a gradual, is a, it's a gradual thing of getting more and more information. The most basic element in any dossier is that we know there is a, there is a name. And it may survive only as a place name, kill this, clan that, betus, something else. We have to assume that at some point, there was a person there and that person generated some sort of cult so that the name survived. So the first thing is a name. A very good example would be St. Bridget. All we know with great certainty about Bridget is that there was a woman called Bridget. She was clearly linked to a monastery because if she hadn't been linked to a monastery, no one would have bothered to remember her. And then everything that's added on to that is, is up for question. So the first thing, a name, then there's a date in a calendar. If one was to list all the saints for which we have calendar dates, and it has been done, it's called the martyrology, there are umpteen cults. And on any one day, there might be a hundred or more saints linked to that day. And by the time that Iona was a working monastery, they would have had a martyrology that had been put into Latin by Jerome and had been added to in successive stages so that they could have on any day of the year listed umpteen saints. And all they would have known about the majority of those was the name and it is commemorated on this day. They might have that it was a martyr and they might have a place martyr in Egypt. And that date, what we call a date of death, is seen as the date of birth. Only a handful of saints move beyond that and they have a tomb, a known tomb. And usually if you have a kill, that's a good indication that there was probably a, a, a tomb linked to a saint if that's if it's not a if it's not a common name. It's not only that you need to have a tomb, but you can go one step more than having a tomb. There is actually a cult at a tomb. And a cult is that on the day in the calendar, people go and see this as a patron day. And this would survive in Irish folklore down to the 20th century, where the word patron gives the word pattern. And there are umpteen little tiny townlands all across Ireland who would say, oh, we have a holy well, we know the name of the saint, we know the date, and we have a pattern. 
and that's the cult of the tomb. But that cult would only be known to a tiny area. And if we take that the, the world of the average person in the Middle Ages is a world 15 miles in diameter, as far as you can go from the center out to the edge and back on foot within a day. But if it starts going beyond that, so that people start to adopt it in other places, we can now go from cult at a tomb to fame. The classic Western example of that is St. Martin. A tiny cult begins in the middle of France and Tours. Within a generation, it's known in North Africa. Within a few generations, it's known throughout the Latin world. And indeed, down to today, if you actually look at the liturgical books, you'll find that Martin's Day, the 11th of November, is treated as a great feast simply because church after church has adopted it as one of their feasts. And as more and more churches adopt it, its fame builds. And we'll see when we read Adavnon's Vita that he's very conscious that this is already beginning to happen to Columba, and he is very anxious that it should happen and spread even wider. You not only have to be known, but you actually have to have it accepted into other people's calendars. So that not only is my church celebrating this day, but your church is celebrating this day. And it's this gradual process of adopting one another's feasts that forms one of the networks in the early medieval churches. And with that goes that other places will start adopting the name. So we can follow, take a, a saint that we know almost nothing about, Saint Marnog. We can follow the spread of his cult by watching how place names, Kilmarnock in Scotland, Port Marnock in Dublin. The spread of the names will give you the spread of the cult. And lastly, for a very small group of saints, we actually get a vita. Now, the vita is not a biography. The vita is a very precise document that is to help you who are listening to the vita always in a situation where you're celebrating the feast, to actually understand not only why you're celebrating the feast, but the benefits to you and your church of celebrating the feast. And of all of the early Irish lives, none fits that universal pattern better than Cullen Kill, because we have all of the, the different parts of the dossier, and we have a highly developed vita uh, by someone who has been, who been very careful to access whatever information he, he had, had of known, and then to remodel that information and to put it into a programmatic format of three books, which is derived from, a, from, from an earlier hagiographical tradition going back to the life of St. the life of uh, uh, Athanasius's life of St. Anthony as translated into Latin by Evagrius. Let's dwell on this notion of the Dies Natalis. Our perception of dates of death is always termination. 
go into any cemetery today and they'll give you the birth and the death date, the range 1950 to 1990 or whatever. And it's the sense that life is a closed entity. For Adivnon, the Vita works exactly the other way around. It's from a non-entity growing consistently to a point when he can achieve all of the gifts. He can see visions, he can make prophecies, he can make, he, he, can, he can perform healings that a saint should be able to do, but even able to do them on this side of the grave. So the Dies Natalis is far closer to our idea of a graduation day. Okay, it's the end of one phase, but it's the beginning of the other, and it's being celebrated precisely because it's a successful achievement. Death is the achievement, and the Vita is a statement by the monastery that its graduates are doing well. And so when they look around at the graveyard, the individual grave is usually seen as corresponding to the biblical notion of a sepulchrum, the place where the body is actually laid. That's the ground you actually dig with a shovel or the, the building that you place the remains in. But the collective area is the place, and this was made explicit in Out of Known, as we'll see later, as the place where the members of that community, from Columba down to the most junior novice listening to Out of Known, reading the Vita, either are waiting or will wait for the resurrection. So where one waits is terribly important. And Adivnon is very clear that some people should not be waiting in Iona. He has Columbus say, you will, will not be buried in my monastery meaning you will not be part of this community, you must go to another community and there become a monk. He's equally clear that the damned have no graves. There are several wicked people who are, the, these are the guys in the, you know, the, the Vita is full of people in white hats and black hats. There are no, there's no shades of gray in the Vita. And the people in black hats, they don't, they would be waste, a grave would be wasted on them. And so their burial places are not to be recorded. Another writer a generation younger than Adivnon and who would have met him, Bede says, we don't even need to remember their names. Why remember their names? They're not, that part of the history is over. So the question is, where is the true community of Iona? And I'd have known would, without batting an eye, I'd say the true community is the community that are in the graves because they've passed the exams, they've passed the test, and now they're no longer limited by their bodies. And so they're fully members of the community because they're out there in the, in the coimaterium. So the graves are interim and they're waiting to hear the trumpet that Paul talks about, or for Adivnon, a phrase from John chapter 5, 28, those who are in the tombs will hear his voice. And so for Adivnon, this is a feast precisely because this is the coming of age of the illustrious Columba. And in remembering Columba, 
they are experiencing in you his presence among them in the community. He's present among them in the graveyard and virtually. But on the feast day, when they remember him, they are enabled to experience in you his presence, not only as the founder of the monastery, but as the monastery's chief intercessor. And so there's a cycle that those who are alive in the monastery, physically alive, are remembering those who have died. And those who have died are assisting that community with their prayers. And just as the graveyard is the place where they're being held, so the relic is the tangible link between not now and the past, but between now and the future. So that raises the question, on this feast day, who is celebrating in Iona? One visits the saint by visiting the monastery where the saint is buried. So there's the living in the monastery who are paying tribute and offering thanks for the dead. And the dead are interceding and aiding the living. But on the shadows of this liturgical group, there are two other groups. And I've deliberately chosen examples from outside of that final chapter. Wherever the living and the dead are praying together, there are angels present. So angels can be met with in the fields and angels are met with in the liturgy. But there are also demons. A monk is bringing a bucket of milk from where he's been milking a cow into the monastery and he meets Columbus, Columbus says, stop. Inside in that bucket, there is a demon. If you go any further, the demon will be let loose inside the monastic enclosure. But luckily, not only is Columba able to spot the demon, but he's able to expel it. And by the way, I hope everyone has had their supper. Gregory the Great says, not batting an eyelid, very dangerous to eat salad. I don't touch lettuce. And remember, lettuce is considered a, a, a sort of a delicacy in the, in, in the Roman palate. Pliny once said he liked his guests so much he gave each of them a head of lettuce, a whole head of lettuce for each guest, uh, Pliny the Younger. Uh, but Gregory, no, no, don't eat lettuce, he warns Peter. Why, Father Gregory, should I not eat lettuce? Because I have never known a place that more demons like to hide than lettuce and so be swallowed by the saints. So they think of the monastery as the Lord's holy mountain, but they think of it as involving a very complex dramatis personae. Now, this is a very different view of Christian prayer than anything that would be in use today, even a place like Mount Athos. It does survive in a few places. There's a little, much later prayer uh, in the Book of Common Prayer, and it has survived in the Roman bravery, uh, visit aquasimus, visit this Lord, we pray you, may your holy angels keep it safe, drive away the angels, drive away the demons, and may your household then sleep in peace. Now, we just think of that as a, as a very, as a sort of a nice, very uh, pre-modern set of images for the community that was celebrating this feast with Adivnon, these four groups, the living, the dead, the angels and the demons are all engaged together. And it's indeed 
Columba's ability not only to, to spot demons and head them off, but to enjoy the colloquy of angels, to, for, for him to be able to see angels and then have angels visit him, that is the greatest proof of his sanctity. Now, if we think of those ideas and keep that little diagram in front of you, I'd like to just quickly go through the final chapter of the Vita Columbae. The death is fixed exactly in a liturgical time span. And he knows that he's dying because angels now hover over the oratory, but they're seen only by Columba. And of course, angelic visions, he will immediately tell you, are, that, are those which fill the elect with joy. So the fact that he can see angels is a demonstration of the elect. And the angels tell him that the angels are there and he immediately knows it to bear his soul to paradise. Human beings are less, are less able to know this, but a horse, his horse can know this. And again, this is a curious notion that because the horse is not, now at one level, of course, this is the motif of the weeping horse uh, is, is first found in the Iliad. Uh, the horse Kantos um, weeps in the Iliad. But for Adivnon, the weeping horse is the brute beast whose mind has not been darkened by sin has a higher chance of seeing the angels than the other monks. So Columba can see the angels, the horse can see the angels, and gradually it dawns on the community. So he blesses the monastery and he blesses it so that other monasteries and other churches will adopt its feast. And he actually says, I will, and I shall intercede for you. Et ego comipso manems provopus inter, interpellabo. I will be the one who, when born into paradise, will make intercession. Now, if alarm bells are going off and saying, hmm, there's something wrong there, good. They should go off because all Western Christians have a different view of saintly intercession, which came into use in the 12th and 13th centuries, and then was further adapted in the 16th century. But this is a, this is a different theological world. So now there are three visions. At midnight, angels fill the church, and he dies gazing upon the holy angels. So there's the community. Now he has moved from the living to the dead and the angels are present. And I'd have known then to just to let you know that he's still on duty. In death, he was like a living sleeper. Ut non quasi mortui, not like something dead. Said dormientus, Federator viventis, but in sleeping he seemed to be alive. And then there's a second vision. The whole island is lit up by angelic brightness. The whole sky is full of light and they can see him bearing him aloft. <coughs> and they can see an angelic highway that's based on the story of Jacob's Ladder in the book of Genesis. Interestingly, this is not just seen by the monks on Iona. This is seen in faraway places. This is not just an Iona related event. It's a, an event that should interest all the other monasteries. And then we're 
curious detail. Adenon gives us a very, of how he knows this. X told Y told Z told me, and we know where that, that man lived. And there's a technical reason for that. And then lastly, ordinary people will see it. While they were fishing, they saw a pillar of light rise from Iona right into the heavens. And again, this was seen by Ernena. And again, we're told that Ernena awaits resurrection with the saints among the saints of Iona. But we're also told how he heard Ernena told me, and because Adivnon is the abbot, his word has an automatic validity. The vision's not only witness to holiness, but then there's a three day funeral. And this will fulfill a prophecy that Columba had made. He said, only my monks will be at my burial. Sure enough, as soon as the light disappears, the waters around Iona become unnavigable. So all the people who would want to have come cannot, and there's only the monks at the burial. So even in the very last time they see the body of Columba, they see it fulfilling a prophecy. And then finally, Adivnon ends 323 with a Trinitarian form of the vision of the community of saints. And that's taken directly out of Gregory the Great's Dialogues, book three. Now, this leaves us with a problem. Rudolf Bultmann once said that God was visible and tangible to the authors of Genesis. And that was his way of saying the perception of God can be radically different in different generations. I would say it is almost equally true for Adivnon. Columba is as active. Indeed, he's more powerfully active now that he's no longer weighed down by flesh, a phrase used by Adivnon, because he stands, the phrase uses, in the gate of heaven. He is Iona's intercessor in chief, and Adivnon, as the abbot, is merely his liturgical stand in. Now, the question is. Why does he give us all this detail? Well, if you were to ask anyone from 1520 onwards in the Western church, either they would say, saints do not intercede because that would compromise the intercession of Christ, or else they intercede with Christ and Christ with the Father, and then it is God who performs the miracle. So it's a very clear, X asks Y and Y does it. So it's not a case that it's St. Anthony who finds your keys, St. Anthony intercedes and God helps you find your keys. Now that's the neat theological question. The interesting thing is that there was a debate going on in Constantinople around the year 600. Do the saints intercede? There are two schools of opinion. First is the saints can't intercede because that would detract from Christ and that would detract from the power of God. If the saints do anything, they are merely other prayers. In the West, that was already the standard position because Augustine had famously said in a book that was known to Adivnon, De Cura Pro Mortuis, that either the saints are indifferent to the needs or they are merely knowledgeable and add their voice in prayer. Augustine is clear, the saints do not do. 
The problem was that the Greeks, in the form of Eustasius of Constantinople, said that the saints do actually do. It's not a case that the spirit inspires a vision in the mind of the saint. The saint actually sees. It's the saint's virtus that is at work. And so it is the saint who actually acts. It's this vision of sanctity that becomes standard for the West from the time of Gregory the Great. The old Augustinian idea is just let wither on the vine. And for the next thousand years, saints are real actors, just as they had real powers of prophecy and vision and healing on earth. So that's the saint who heals. So after death, they too can see and act. They never rationalize their vision of the end. Is this the second coming? Is this a realized eschatology? None of these things are sorted out. These won't be sorted out for another three or 400 years. It's only with Peter the Lombard that these contradictions will start to become central to the work of theology and reconciling them become an even more important part. And then eventually, since some of them can't be reconciled, the whole vision would split apart. But for Eustasius of Constantinople, his Latin friend, Gregory the Great, and then Gregory's disciple on Iona, I'd have known, it is important that Columba is not just inspired and inspiring, but he is truly a person of power who can intercede and make a difference. And that leaves us with a very interesting question. Why does Gregory and then Adivnon want to tie themselves up in knots to deal with this question? Well, I suspect the answer is this. They weren't really interested in a theological argument. The argument in the end would lead to the iconoclast crisis in the East and it would lead to the whole crisis uh, on the nature of intercession and grace in the West in the 16th century. They're not actually interested in that problem per se, though Adivnon at the level of a technical theologian is clearly taking his lead from Gregory the Great and you can see him carefully manipulating the evidence to fit the Gregory model but rather they're dealing with a more basic problem. And the problem was this, holy men had a reputation of having power. They really did things. They found keys, they healed sore eyes, they healed sore throats, they could heal broken bones. And people went the cult built up for these saints because they were seen to actually dispose power. And so the Vita is not only adding to the cult, it's trying to rationalize the cult within the larger picture of Christian theology. So why should we read the Vita Columbae today? Well, we should read it because through it, we can see the details. We don't see a, an early, an early insular monastery, but we can see through its lattices and see what it was like to be a monk out on the windswept northwestern shores of Europe. We can also see the technical vision of holiness that inspired generations of saints and still would inspire 
many of the monks in Mount Athos today. At a third level, we can see it as a technical treatise in trying to deal with what, from the time it was first raised in the fourth century down to today, is a major problem for the Christian churches. The question, how does intercession and the work of the Christ interact? But we can also see it as a practical document. Here is Adifnon, a theologian. He's read the letter to the Hebrews. He's read the book of Exodus. He can put those things together and he can see that there is a problem in the nature of having saints as power brokers in a monotheism. And yet the fact is, the cult is larger than the theology. And so I would suggest that the fourth reason for reading it is, it's an attempt at doctrine to catch up with the runaway horse that is religious experience and the need of people to have centers of security and power and healing in their lives. From, of course, a historian's point of view, it's a wonderful example of how we can never read a text without demythologizing it. But that is not a negative thing to do because every decoding re encodes that text. And insofar as we try to come to grips, with another world, the world that could say on this feast day, Kulum Kila Coinblock, the birthday of the illustrious Kulum Kila, we actually discover more about our own situation. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tom and um, for that wonderfully stimulating uh, lecture. It's a great start to, to the series. Uh, we just have some time for uh, some discussion and Q&A. Um, if the attendees would like to, there's a Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. Any questions that you'd like to ask, please uh, enter them there. Um, I just like to, you, you shared an article uh, with me, Tom, that I'm going to share with uh, the attendees tomorrow. It's a, it's a recent article about um, Charles Thomas's um, excavations on, uh, on Iona. Um, could you talk a little bit about Iona as the New Jerusalem and and what what uh, Thomas's excavations have have kind of revealed about about that? Well, one of the things that that Thomas is. The, the article I'm sharing was produced only, it only was only published just after Christmas this year uh, by uh, uh, Ewan, uh, Ewan uh, Campbell and, um, oh gosh, this is embarrassing. I've forgotten the other man. It's a, it's a double bar. It's a, it's a, it's a twin article. And they, they published it in the Antiquaries Journal. And what they did was they have been working through uh, Charles Thomas's excavations from the late 50s and early 60s and trying to put them into a into a picture of what how did I how did the community on Iona see itself in around around the year 700 and what emerges very clearly from the archaeological evidence is that they see themselves as not only we think of them as the monastery out on the, the wildest, you know, the um, Frederick, Felix Mendelssohn, when he wrote the Hebridean Overture, landed on Iona and said it was the loneliest place on earth. Uh, they actually saw themselves as being able to celebrate on Iona the liturgy of Jerusalem. Now, think about that. 
that means they see themselves as halfway between the historic Jerusalem, where the saints once walked, and the future Jerusalem, the mother in heaven, which St. Paul speaks about. And they, celebrating their liturgy on the island, think of themselves as in a virtual Jerusalem. Now, we know that there are virtual Jerusalems all over Christendom. Uh, famous one in uh, Bologna, and famous one in Rome, uh, famous one in Lucca. But the evidence of the way the buildings were arranged on Iona is pointing more and more when it's combined with the literary evidence that they actually are thinking of themselves on Iona as being in a virtual Jerusalem. And of course, one of the great, one, if you want, if you want to, the quickest way to prove you're a saint is to be able to see things that are far away, to have this sort of television uh, thing. So for instance, um, Columba would just see this the, the zoom. Zoom is the full is is the material fulfillment of a dream. <laughs> uh, some questions are are coming in now. Um, this is from Catherine Ratigan. Uh, if the graveyard was so important in terms of burial, why was Columkilla not buried in the main graveyard at the monastery in Iona? Prob the answer is probably a because he is the he is the leader of the group he's given you, we think of the graveyard and the church as two two very separate places but they're only functionally different insofar as that you need soil in one place and stone floors in another you actually have to think of think of it as a single liturgical complex um, the church and the churchyard form a single a single performing space it's not a case of there is the church and there is the graveyard it's there is where the community assemble to pray some are in graves some are in pews uh, some are walking around some are lying down and the actual fact that he's given a special um a special little chapel to himself, and there are several other chapels, uh, merely is that he is the most special one. And this is a question from Jeff Slater. Um, could you say a little bit about the spread and impact of St. Columba's work and that of Iona after his burial? If you get, a, if you think of, um, if you get an ordinary map, uh, of these islands and rotate it like that, you will see that you can see that Iona is the connecting point, but in a sort of a U shape that starts in Kerry and ends in Kent. And because of that, it, form, it, it formed a very good link road between what was happening in Ireland and what was happening in Anglo-Saxon Britain. And that's why, for instance, people like Oswald, uh, the, 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 the great seventh century Anglo-Saxon king, will have spent time on Iona. And uh, the other, whether or not uh, the, the monastery is the is some sort of missionary center for the Peaks. The, 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 it's very hard to find direct evidence for that. But as soon as the Picts are Christians, they will then adopt that as their great monastery. And so there's a there's a historical circle going on. It's very hard to people say, oh well it was, you know, they think of it as a sort of a, an outpost uh, an outpost of Christianity for a sort of a, a missionary outpost for for the Pictish uh, peoples. That's thinking in a, that's thinking in a in a sort of a logistic world that no one in the the early Middle Ages thought in. Uh, you adopt that which is seen to be valuable. Uh, 
uh, Adavon's contemporary Morocco doesn't see Patrick converting the Irish, he sees Patrick doing displays of power and then the Irish adopt it. So it's, it's, it's the whole question of mission and Iona is, is, is a very complicated one because it's about, a, it's not about selling an idea, it's about later people's recording how they adopted the idea. You mentioned th this fascinating idea of, of kind of networks and particularly if we think of the liturgical feast days and commemoration um, and we're talking about geographically very different very uh, different places to what extent do you think that the kind of liturgical commemoration um, and, and these feast days kind of played a role in creating unity and creating a kind of sense of social cohesion and and shared identity really across the islands well of course it's adopting one another's feast days that creates the links between churches and practically you can track you can track a, a martyrology that arrives in the southern part of britain and you can track its route all the way to ireland by it by getting feasts added to it um, Porygorean in Cork is the sort of master of tracking these, how, but behind the actual, how historians can uh, engineer back the links. Uh, most modern Christians think of Christianity as a sort of a unified ideology, which then spreads. It's far more useful to think of the early medieval situation as individual churches who adopt one another's feasts. Mm -hmm. And the way you establish a link is that I adopt your feasts and you adopt my feasts. And of course, if I have more feasts, I in a sense become the metropolis. Mm -hmm. We might just uh, take two more questions. Uh, this is from uh, Justin Rowe Colvin. Um, my question hinges on the question of sacral topography, both within the cloister and the sheer landscape of the Hebrides. What does Adivnon's treatment of directionality from Ireland and positionality in relation to Ireland say about Ireland and external Ireland's question mark? So Adivnon was quite interested in geography, given his De Locus Sanctis. So how does Ireland fit into this conceptual geography? Uh, can I kick for touch and just say, read the article by uh, Ewan Campbell and Maldonado, because they've gone into it in great detail and they have a very full bibliography. I'll be sending that out uh, tomorrow. Um, this is from Hal Chorpenning. Uh, do burials at Relic Oron exist from the time of Colum Killa, or is it a later medieval burial site? Do Thomas's excavations also cover Relic Oron? Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, Thomas uncovered was a processional path that led from the monastery to the cemetery. And you can see the maps that he drew and have been redrawn and then have been enhanced using modern ground penetrating radar uh, to show that, that is, it is virtually certain that that area has been part of the monastery since the very beginning. And it is almost certainly the place where the burials took place. Needless to say, since it is a, a living working uh, cemetery, uh, there are still burials taking place there. And indeed, John Smith, the, the, the Scottish Labour leader, when he died suddenly in the early 90s, a sign that he was one of the, the great was that he was, even though he wasn't connected with Iona, he's buried on Iona. Now, because it's a living cemetery, they can't, they, you know, you just can't dig up every bone in it. But 
very close to there, they have found uh, fragments of charcoal and those, so there is, there is continuity at that site all the way back. But, you know, there's only one, you know, whenever you meet an archeologist, you always say, but this could change tomorrow morning. And they say, yes. Just a final question from Maureen Prescott. Uh, is there a connection between Dunad Fort at Kilmartin and Columkilla? Uh, the answer to that is that there, it is mentioned in the it's mentioned in the Vita, uh, and whether or not Columba was ever in any particular place is one of those imponderables of history. Is it clear that at the time of the writing, there was a link in the minds of those who, who saw themselves as his successors? Certainly. Okay. The basic rule of hagiography is a, a, a vita is primary evidence for the time of its writing and only incidentally evidence for its subject's time. Well, thank you so much for all your questions and, and thank you again, uh, Tom, for, for a fascinating lecture. Um, so thank you again for, for joining us this evening. Uh, the next lecture in the series will be on the 29th of June at uh, the same time. Uh, I'll be sending you the registration. Uh, you need to register for each lecture. Um, and you can also find details on the Loyola Institute uh, website or on columnkiller.net uh, in the event section. Um, so just to say that you will need to register for, for each lecture. Uh, the next uh, speaker will be Professor Jonathan Wooding from the University of Sydney, Australia, who will present on Peregrinatio in the careers of Colum Killa and his monastic family. So I hope you can join us for our second lecture in the series. And in the meantime, uh, Sloan, August Bannock. Sloan Blair. <laughs>